Hi, and welcome to Module 2 of Lecture 5, covering the definite integral. The definite integral is the integral that most closely corresponds to the intuitive definition we talked about briefly in the previous module as the area under a curve. So, to remind you, if this is my curve, we often, in inference and utility, want to understand the area under the curve between two points. That's this shaded region over here. This region can be computed by computing the definite integral. In one dimension, the definite integral produces a nice clear number. In more than one, it has not the, it's not quite as clear, but it does reduce the number of variables by one. A definite integral can be thought can be thought of as a limit of sums. And that's what we're going to talk about mostly today. So let's start off with it with a with a simple example. Here is a nice simple function that is constant. How might we compute the, 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 the um, area under the curve from say zero through to this point right over here? Well, we could try to approximate the whole continuous thing by areas we understand, namely rectangles. So if I take, and it's supposed to be a straight line. <laughs> um, Turns out it's hard to do on a tablet, which I'm running on at an angle. Um, but if we take all these as rectangles, and we compute the area in each rectangle, and then we add all the rectangles together, we'll get an exact, exact specification of the area under the curve. And the rectangles, the rectangles themselves are pretty easy to figure out. We'll call this delta x the width of a rectangle. And the height is just the function at that point. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. And in fact, the width of the rectangle matters not at all. Right? I can make one big rectangle. I could make very small rectangles and add a whole lot of them. It doesn't really make a difference. As long as I cover the entire function, the sum of this thing with all the little individual widths of each rectangle, right? So look at the function at this point over here. Here's my first point. Take the value of the function. That's this. Multiply by this. That's the width. That's the area of this rectangle. Do it again at this point, and again at this point, and this point, and so on. You add them all together. As long as you cover the entire space, you will get the area under. Um, the curve. So you just split up this overall, say if this is 0 to 1, you might split it up into 10 rectangles, or maybe 5, or maybe 2, whatever. If you make it 10 rectangles, then each delta x is 1 tenth. If you make it 2, then each delta x is um, 1 half, and so on. You split up however you want, you get the exact area under the curve. You need no calculus at all for this. Okay, how about a slightly more complicated one? What if you have a linear function? Just like that. What's the area under this curve? From here to here, say. Well, it's not a rectangle, but if I draw lots of shapes that look like this, I can pretty easily figure out what the area under the curve is by adding all those shapes together, and the area of those shapes is pretty clear. In fact, if I take the midpoint, if I take my, my points at the midpoint of each shape, then the amount below and above the line will cancel out. So I can take the midpoint and just treat this thing as effectively a rectangle. So this actually works just fine too, which is great, as long as I take the midpoint of these, of these um, segments. So again, I can take a whole lot of these shapes Add the areas together, each area I can compute easily, and I get the area under the curve. Right, here's that one. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> right, so far no calculus needed. Just some geometry and some effort. What if I now have a parabola, right, x squared? Well, how about the area under the curve from here to here? Again, there should be straight lines and I apologize. <laughs> um, well, 
if I draw these shapes, which have curved tops, I'll get the area under the curve. These are trickier. Um, they're not straight. The area under them is a little more trickier. But you could figure them out. You could figure out using geometry what the area under this curve, the curve is. Um, you have to get a little fancier with your shapes. You have to replace the top with parabolas themselves and then add it that way. It's not as easy, but you could, in theory, do it. Okay. Let's jump ahead now, though. How about that? Right. That's relatively smooth, and still, the amount of different kinds of shapes that I would need to make that thing work is a lot. Right? Um, and as you do more and more complicated functions, the kind of shapes you would need to do to add up to make this actually work as, as the integral becomes a lot. Um, so this wouldn't be okay here, and there's a certain shape, but there's a different shape over here, and it becomes just non-feasible to do after a while. So what do we do? Well, one solution um, posited by, by Riemann was to take our little areas and use rectangles, but make them as small as humanly possible, right? Here's the reason. If this is my funky curve, and I consider a rectangle like this, that's thick, it does a pretty poor job of actually approximating the area, right? There's all this missing stuff up here that's not part of the area in the rectangle. So when you add them up, you miss all those areas. If you made um, the rectangle smaller, however, right? So you have this function again, you know, the rectangle is smaller, the area you're missing over here is actually small enough that in this kind of poor way I'm drawing here, you can't actually see what you're missing. There's still something you're missing, but it's small now. And in the limit, as you take these, these um, things smaller and smaller and smaller, as these rectangles get smaller and smaller and smaller, you're losing less and less and less area either above or below a rectangle. As you lose less and less area, you approximate closer and closer and closer the actual area under the curve. And that is the insight between the Riemann integral, which is effectively the limit of a sum of rectangles. The limit of the sum of the area of rectangles as each the width of each rectangle goes to zero. So we take our function we did before, our sum we had before rather, we call that look like this, the sum on i of the individual function values times each, and let's assume all the different um, widths are the same size. You take this thing as this thing goes to zero. So in the limit, as the width of the rectangles gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you get closer and closer and closer to the actual true area under the curve. Note, this was not necessary for the discrete change, right? So if I have, um, if I at time one increased by three and at time two increased by 2.2 .2, and at time three increased by 7.1, I can just add these. It doesn't matter that they're not um, a nice convenient linear function or constant function. I can just add those numbers up because of the discrete change. If you have continuous change, on the other hand, I can't add up all the infinitesimally small things that go into a continuous function. That's where the limit comes in, and that's where the integral comes in. The integral is the limit of the sum of rectangles as the width of the rectangles goes to zero. We write that an analog to the sum like this. This is an S, and there's a lot of different sort of variations of how to write the S. Um, I'm not very good at it, so this is my S. Sometimes let's do this. Um, it's kind of like a curly S. It's meant to represent sum, right? So the sum operator over here is a Greek capital S. This integral looks like an S. <laughs> it's also a sum in a sense of a continuous function. The rest of the integral looks like this. There's no more I's to index it because you're doing every single point. So that's an analog with here. This is an analog with here. The dx here is an analog with delta x. This dx here is what we call an infinitesimal. It's an object that is infinitesimally small. 
It exists, but it's infinitesimally small. As a practical matter, you'll other than making sure you're included in your integrals, you're not going to spend too much time with that dx, with the sole exception of the process of substitution when trying to solve integrals, which we'll get to in a later module. But by and large, early on, you should be including that dx there to make sure you remember that it's supposed to be there. It means the same thing in a sense as over here. It means that you're, in effect, adding infinitesimally small rectangles together. As an aside, I should note that this is not the most general kind of integral in the universe. There are other kinds of integrals that if you go on in math, you might learn about. The big integrals are one. Um, that dx associated with measure. Measure theory is a big branch of math and probability. You can learn probability in terms of measure theory. Um, there'll be classes for that in the math and stats departments. We're not going to do that here. We're going to, for our purposes, it's perfectly fine to assume that an integral is the area under the curve. I'm going to do this integral only. Um, now, I said the area under a curve, in the case of the sum, it was kind of implicitly defined what bounds of the area you care about are. That's not the case over here, so we have to add two more things to the integral, which are the bounds. You put the lower bound on the bottom of the integral next to it, and the upper bound on the top of the integral. That means I want the area under the curve starting from A and going to B. So if this is my curve, and this is A, and this is B, that integral will give me this area in here for any function. It does not have to be a linear function, or a constant function, or, or a polynomial, or even a um, quadratic function, because you're not trying to actually rely upon some approximation of the, of the width of the um, shape that you're sticking in there and adding up, you're actually taking the rectangles that are infinitesimally small and thereby you can deal with any shape of function at all. That is a definite integral. We'll do a lot more of how to compute them later, but right now it helps to work a little more with the notation to get a sense of it. So let's rewrite an, a definite integral up here. Let's say you had some function like this, and here's a and here's b, and then here's c in the middle. Well, you might think that the area from here to here, um, plus the area from here to here, equals the area from here to here, right? So the area from a to c plus the area from c to b is the same as the area from a to b. You'd be right. The integral deals with that just fine. You can split the bounds up like this, so as we see. So you just treat each one separately, add them up, just as you would expect from the geometry of the problem. If you're trying to take a big area, you can split up into two smaller areas. So this so integrals have this property of the bounds in that you can add, you can split the bounds up and have one part over here and one part over here, and just add them up separately. So that's, that can be convenient at times. Um, that is pretty much it for the definite integral. That's how you define it. That's what it means, is the area under the curve. We'll talk about how to actually compute it later. But the good thing is, once you know how to compute the integral itself, the definite integral will spit out actual exact numbers in one dimension. It'll give you an actual area that you can you know, hang your hat on, right? It's a real thing takes the actual area, which is very useful because it's going to be used to calculate probabilities, and you wouldn't want probability not to be a number, right? You want the probability to be something like 20% or whatever, right? So that's what it's used for. That's the definite integral. Um, the indefinite integral we'll cover the next module, and that's a little more abstract than the definite one, but on the plus side has close ties to the derivative, so we can connect them pretty easily. Thank you very much.